there is a shift. It's in the spirit realm. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Spirit is so gracious. He speaks to us in a way we understand. And he speaks to us um, with a full understanding of, of where we are as a person. But the, the longing of the Father's heart is that we shift with the Holy Spirit. And sometimes, you know, we want to think about it. We're not sure about it. Is it God? Is it not us? But there is a shift. Now we've got an election next Saturday, which will bring a shift to our nation. Please, God, let the prayers of the saints be heard and let it be a righteous shift for the sake of the nation, for the sake of the nation. But there is a... Uh, There is a, a, like a pulling is maybe the wrong word, but there is such a yearning from the heavenlies for us to readjust and to reestablish and to come into truth because a lot of the things that we have believed in the past have been religion and have been church and has not been truth or freedom or life or love. Um, and so there's this wooing of the Holy Spirit, if you like, but the Holy Spirit also is very aggressive. Yeah, come on. He can be very violent. I mean, who else did God send into the world, not into believers, but into the world to convict the world of their sin? So for the Holy Spirit to enter into places where he's not wanted, where people aren't interested in anything that he has to say, but his assignment is to convict people of sin, of righteousness and of judgment, to prepare them for salvation and redemption. He is aggressive. He is light. And uh, that's why I love the, the black um, in the logo, because we are to release light, and light is called into, into places of darkness. But there is a, a shifting, and that's what I want to talk about today. The reason of the fivefold for the sake of the, of the body of Christ and what exactly, the starting of the talk of what exactly is an ecclesia. And I know some of you have been through this in the past, um, and some of you haven't heard this teaching. So we're just going to re recap, review, and, uh, and move forward. And we have to move forward. Yeah. We have to. We have to progress as the body of Christ. Because if you look at the number of churches in this nation, even on the Gold Coast, there is well over 400 churches, well over 400 churches. And yet our communities have not been changed. We are still an ungodly community. We still have homelessness, domestic violence, drug abuse. We have theft. We have all sorts of things, rapes, we have all sorts of things happening. Um, so um, even though we've got well over 400 churches on the Gold Coast, we have not been agents of transformation. We've not brought heaven to earth, which is what the Father intended. And so we need to look at these things. So before we start, I just take authority over the spirit of stupor and witchcraft. Yeah. And I bind and break your power now in Jesus' name. There is nothing in here but the spirit of God. In the name of Jesus. So this this um, this is titled. Well, first of all, before we move forward, I want to show you a prophetic timeline. According to Hosea chapter six verse two, after two days he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live for him. Two days, he will revive. But on the third day, he will raise us up. And 2 Peter 3.8, Nevertheless, do not let this one fact escape you, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Prophetic timeline. He says, I want you to remember this. Don't forget this. I want you to remember that one day is as a thousand years a thousand years is one day. So going back to Hosea, in two days, he will revive us and the third day he will raise us up. 
So since Jesus, there's roughly been 2,000 years since his birth, death, resurrection and ascension, 2,000 years, two days. We're as a body of Christ, as the church, we're entering into the third day, which is a completely different uh, shift than the second day. This is the third day. Talk of resurrection, resurrection power, ascension glory. You are of the ascension generation. You are sons of the and daughters of the resurrection. This is a new era. The third day is unfolding with resurrection power and glory. And we have longed to see this. This is what we're hungry to see. This is the prophetic timeline. Now, there is a lot of teaching out there about end times, antichrist, doom and gloom scenarios. But if Jesus is coming back, for a victorious bride without spot or wrinkle, let's focus on what Jesus tells us to focus on and not on the fear of the doom and gloom side of things. So this is about the ecclesia, the fivefold and the saints. Matthew 16, 13, we want to go there. Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi and he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? He's saying, basically, if it was a political thing, like, what's the polls say? Where are the statistics? What are people saying about me? What are the rumours? And they said, well, some say that you're John the Baptist, others Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So what they're saying is that nobody really knows, Jesus, who you are. There's lots of inferences. There's lots of guesses. But nobody really knows who you are. But then Jesus makes it really personal. And he says, but who do you say? I am. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Now the word Simon, Simon Barjona, Simon, the son of John. But Simon in the Greek actually means a wavering reed. But if you take it back to the Hebrew uh, meaning, it's Shimeon or Simeon, and it means a revelatory listening ear. That was the one of the tribes, remember, of, of, of Jacob, one of the tribes. It means listen, God has heard me, God has listened. So when he says Simon, if you take it back to the original Hebrew, it means I've got a, a listening ear, I'm ready for revelation, I'm, I'm open to this. And this is a direct revelation. I love revelation because God has intervened into my thought processes. He's birthed a, a truth in my spirit or was, was already in my spirit because my spirit's connected with him. So we're one with God. So, But he's birthed this into my thought processes. All of a sudden I get this revelation. My thinking changes. My mental processes are, oh my gosh, it's not the way I thought. It's about this. And that revelation is amazing. The revelation holds the key for you to get out of current situations and circumstances that are taxing you, that are opposing you. Revelation always holds a key and a true revelation should release a revolution yeah. Yeah. in who you are and how you live. It's pointless having a revelation from God if it doesn't change the way you think, speak and act. Yeah. It has to produce a revolution in, in everything. So there's a, an awakening, talking about an awakening. There was an awakening in Peter's thoughts. There's an awakening. So God, we just pray right now that we also will have ears to hear, our hearts to understand and eyes to see the truth of the word, that we would receive revelation, that we would receive the awakening that you want to release into us and through us for the sake of, of the nations, Lord an awakening, a divine intervention into our thought processes. And in Matthew 16, he says, I'll say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, or the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So a lot of people believe that he's saying to Peter, well, hey, you know, you're the, you're the rock upon this rock, Peter. Upon you, the church is going to be built. But there's two Hebrew words there. And if, if the church was built upon the Apostle Peter, it would be a terrible place. Because even though after he got filled with the Holy Spirit, but, you know, like, come on. He was a man. 
Jesus Christ is the foundation and the cornerstone of the church. Jesus Christ is the one. We can't look to anybody but Jesus. And so he said, uh, um, so Peter means they're um, a small detached rock, something that's movable. But he said, on this rock I'll build my church is an immovable bedrock, something that cannot be shifted. And this is Jesus, the cornerstone. And Jesus said, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And those words bound and loosed are governmental terms. They are jurisdictional. You have the power with the keys of heaven to unlock whatever you need to unlock for resources, uh, for anything that you need, but you also have the power with the keys of heaven to lock out anything that you don't want in your life. You've got the keys to unlock people's hearts. Pointless preaching the gospel if people's hearts are locked, you can unlock them with the keys of heaven. Peter, when Peter preached in Acts chapter 2, uh, he was preaching to people whose hearts were open. He used the keys of heaven to release heaven on earth through his words and to unlock the hearts of people. We need to understand how to unlock the hearts of people to receive the truth of the word. So the keys are open and locking, they provide access and protection and this is talking about the jurisdiction of a kingdom government. And so he said to Peter, I'll say to you, Peter, that on this rock I'll build my church. So this was at Caesarea Philippi. Jesus went out of his way to a position in Israel, a place in Israel that was he, no self-respecting Jew would ever go there. He went way out of his way, over 30 miles. I didn't stop to work out how many kilometres that is. But he went 30 miles out of his way with his disciples to bring them to right in front of Caesarea Philippi, which was a, a big mountain. There was a cliff there. There's a, a gaping, yawning cave at the front of it and uh, the river of Jordan flowed into it. But it was a place no self-respecting Jew would go because it was full of temples and, and temple prostitutes and all kinds of things. At the Caesarea Philippi, the, it was called the Gates of Hell. The, it was called that, the Gates of Hell or the Gates of Hades. And uh, the river Jordan actually flowed into the cave at the base of the mountain and that was the, the that was where the people believed it was the um, access into the underworld. That was where the demonic spirits and the dead would go, access into the abyss, if you like. And so this was, this was an ungodly place. And Jesus takes his people right there and stands them in front of a place they would never even think of going and talks to them about it. You have got to be ready for Jesus to take you places that you never thought you would ever go because he wants to talk to you about it. Now, they were safe in Jesus. They weren't affected by it. It didn't affect them spiritually or anything. But he's pointing at Caesarea Philippi and he's saying, guys, I need you to understand that I am building my church. I am building it. And the word church is not church. It's ecclesia. And it's a governmental term. It is not a, a, a religious term at all. It's purely governmental. And we'll look at that in a moment. But Jesus said, I am building my ecclesia. My, I am building it. So when we talk about church plants and when we talk about growing the church, if we're doing it, if we're praying it, guess what? It is not part of the ecclesia of Jesus. It has to be uh, started, built, founded by Jesus. Jesus said, I am building my church. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things out there that are not quite built by Jesus. Yeah. So he said, I am building it. So like I said, this, this place was shunned. It was called the Rock of the Gods, the temple dedicated to Greek, to Pan, which was, he, he, it was originally it was Baal, but when Greek sort of came to the forefront, they gave Baal a facelift and now called him Pan. And it was a temple that was dedicated to shepherds, to music, to um, pleasure and to fear. And it was a pagan stronghold and a Roman stronghold. And Jesus went out of his way to take the disciples there. As I said, it was the, the, the doorway of the cave. The river went into the great abyss. But it was a deliberate action plan. Now, sometimes we don't go where Jesus wants to take us because we don't think Jesus would take us there. That is so true. <laughs> I don't think Jesus would be in this. I don't think Jesus would take us there. And I remember once when the Lord said to me, although I argued, I argued, 
But I, I, I love movies and TV shows, so it's a weakness. I've got to watch. If I turn it on, I can binge, you know, so, and I've got better things to do with my time, but my flesh loves it. And it was one of the Lethal Weapon movies that had come out, the one with the South African ambassador. And the Lord said, I want you to go and see that movie. And I had made a decision that I wasn't going to anything that was an M or anything like that. I said, no, God, that can't be you. You don't want me to go there. That's, that's not you. I, I can't go, you know, because it's, it's M rated and, the, and the, the language and it's just, it's not godly. God, I can't go and see that. But it would not go away. And I thought, oh, God, if this is really you, I'll go, you know. But I, had, I was really like, God cannot seriously be asking me to do this when... I can get sucked into the movies and TV so easily. God's really not asking me to go and see something that's so full of, of, of bloodshed and violence and death because one of the scriptures he gave me early on when he told me to turn off the TV was Psalm 101 verse 3 where it says, set no ungodly thing before your eyes. So I'm arguing, but I went. And halfway through the movie, there was this revelation that even though the South African ambassador had, behind, had been behind murders and all sorts of things, the law could not touch him because he was an ambassador, because his, he, he was, lived in an embassy. It might be on American soil, but the embassy was actually South African soil. And so he had diplomatic immunity. And I'm sitting there watching that, and then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, but you have spiritual diplomatic immunity. And I could have jumped up and preached a sermon in that movie theatre because, oh, my gosh, it was more exciting than, than Mel Gibson and everything else that was happening. So, oh my gosh, I've got this diplomatic immunity. I am spiritually immune, diplomatically, spiritually immune to the works of the enemy. My home is my embassy. It belongs to the kingdom of God. It is on holy land. I'm in this place and, and I cannot be touched by the enemy. You know what I mean? So this revelation, God divinely intervened in my thought processes and changed everything, but he took me to a place I never thought I would go. And so often we shut him down because surely this can't be God. Surely this can't be God. Well, just remember Caesarea Philippi and the fact that he took his 12 disciples there because surely this shouldn't be Jesus taking his disciples to the temple of Pan. Surely he would not take his disciples to the, to the gate of the abyss. Surely he wouldn't do that. But he did. He did. Because he wanted them to see that what he had and what he gave them was much more powerful than anything that was going on in the, in the uh, Caesarea Philippi. And we've got to remember that he is not only Lord, but he's king. So Psalm 29 verses 10 and 11 says, The Lord sat enthroned at the flood and the Lord sits as king forever. And the Lord gives strength to his people and the Lord blesses his people with peace. So because he is my king and my Lord, we are empowered with divine strength and peace every single day of our lives. We've got divine strength and peace to cope with anything that the world throws at us. Our homes are our embassies. We have spiritual immunity to the works of the enemy. There is a power and a force in your life as you step it out that every place the sole of your foot treads, God gives it to you. You might have to do a bit of a fight for it, but God gives it to you and the enemy is completely unthroned. It is about seeking first the kingdom of God, seeking first his righteousness, his kingdom, his righteousness. And you can't seek the kingdom without first seeking the king. So as we seek our king and doing things his way, all things are being added to us. And, the, you know, he was born as a king. He was crucified as a king. And when he um, was resurrected, he ran around for 40 days, I think it was, speaking about the kingdom to the disciples and everyone else before he ascended. He is building his ecclesia. Jesus said, I am, I am, the I am is building the ecclesia. I am and building the church. I am. It is not about 
about God and not about man. It's all about God. It's not about man. It's not about our programs. It's not about our what we what we think. It's not about our planting a church. It is not about our building a church. It is not about the numbers that we get in a church. It is about giving Jesus Christ the freedom to build the ecclesia the way he wants it built, not the way we think it should be, not the way we think that things are, but the way that he wants. He's either king and Lord or he is not, but he builds it. He builds it. So any time I step outside the frame and think this is what he wants and it's not, I have stepped out of allowing Jesus to build. So, you know, the best life we can live is one of surrender to who, who he is in us. But we are, um, he says, I'm building the ecclesia. I am releasing the government of God upon the earth. So in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17 and 23, the first time Jesus started his ministry, he said, the kingdom of God is here. And then he, he, you know, people were healed and set free and delivered. So the kingdom of God brings freedom. It brings healing. It brings deliverance. It brings every good and holy, wholesome thing. It, it writes toxic relationships. It repairs broken families. It provides work where there's unemployment. It provides inspiration when we're feeling blah. It, the kingdom of God is everything. It's within us. It's here. So we should expect the kingdom of God to be released in and through us with demonstration and with power. So what exactly is an ecclesia? The ecclesia prevails against the gates of hell and there are three main areas that it works against. And this is just a foundation. I'm just laying the bare bones, right? Just These are just the, the, like the skeleton and I'm not even sure everything's in its proper place. It's just the skeleton. <laughs> okay, so bear with me. But, you know, it's the ecclesia prevails against the gates of hell, and that is government powers, governmental powers that are entrenched in nations and in cities or communities that have not up from a righteous foundation. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we've, we've had so many losses of freedom in our nation in the past couple of years. We've had an overreach by the government. We've had red tape just like exploding in so many cases. It's harder and harder to run a business because there's more red tape to take care of than ever before. And so, that, but this does not come from the kingdom. God is into business. He, he loves business. And out of all the, the miracles in the book of Acts, only one was inside a church building. The others were all on the streets, in the marketplace. So uh, governmental powers that are entrenched in cities and nations that have not come from God, idolatry, which is represented by Pan, and the devil himself, because this is the gates of hell. So it doesn't matter what we face, whether it's legal, governmental, or whether it's idolatry in ourselves or in the people around us, or whether it's an act of the, the demonic... Um, the ecclesia is always victorious. You've got to think about King David. It says, I can't remember where, but it says about David that he had victory everywhere he went. And if he had that in the Old Testament, we have that in the New. So the ecclesia are operatives of light against the spiritual forces of darkness covering the world. You, you've got to start releasing light. Light dispels darkness. The power of light, the light of Christ, the, the power of um, the light of God, the light of the Holy Spirit, the power of light dispels darkness. And sometimes we spend a lot of time binding and loosing and cutting off and getting rid of and kicking out instead of I release the light of God into that dark situation. The ecclesia is a governmental term. The Greeks used it first, and it's and to be a part of the Greek ecclesia, you had to be 18 years of age or over. You had to be a male, and you had to have had at least two years of military service, or you could not be a part of the ecclesia. So it wasn't just for anybody. It wasn't for every Greek citizen. It was for the men, 18 years of age or over, who had had two years of military service. And then the Romans came along, and they adapted it to their culture. And they actually made it that where two or three Romans met, if they were in a, a little town in Israel, because Israel was oppressed by the Romans, if two or three Romans met in a certain little community, they could make a decree that was ecclesiastical in its governmental authority. And they could say, because two or three Romans have met here and we've agreed on this, then this law will be introduced into this, this territory. 
It did not have to come from Hail Caesar. It could be two or three Roman citizens or whatever it might be. So you've really got to start understanding this. That's why it says in Matthew 18 that where two of us come together and agree, then it will be given to us. So the, there were three main institutions in um, Israel at the time. There was the temple, the synagogue, and there was the... Um, there should be a small e because it's the Roman government, ecclesia, the Roman government with a small e. So it was, it was relig two religious and one governmental, secular institutions and governmental systems. That was what was in Israel at the time. And the temple and the synagogue were static institutions. Members went on specific occasions. Does that sound like a church? <laughs> Just come to a church building come on a Sunday, um, be blessed and toddle off home. But the ecclesia is building less, although I do want a training centre. Yeah. <laughs> I want a training centre and I want the church office out of my home. <laughs> so um, mobile, it's building, it's, but it's a people movement. It operates 24-7. It's where we live and what we do in life. You know, so often we go to church and we think it's only about what happens at church, but we are believers of Jesus Christ 24-7. We, it's all the time. And so an ecclesia, everywhere you go, you are a member of the ecclesia. You're a member of God's government upon the earth. You can release the authority of him everywhere you go. It's having an impact. Now, the interesting thing is during COVID, I was, I was going to say appalled. I'll tone it down to alarmed. Let's tone it down to kind of shocked at the number of churches that received governmental handouts over COVID. They immediately put themselves under governmental control. And, um, you know, but, you know, it's only right we've got staff we need to keep and this will help us, blah, blah, blah. Listen, as a church, you're under God. You can't go somewhere else for help. So we made a decision that we would never, ever go to a governmental handout because it gives the government too much power over the body of Christ. So we decided to, by faith, and we pay our intercessors, um, you know, we, we do things like that. So we decided, no, by faith, God meets our needs. The government does not meet my needs. I'm, you know, and for those of you on a pension, it comes through the government, but the government is not meeting your needs. And if you're on a pension, let me tell you, it does not meet your needs. God is your source. God is your source. And so it's recognising that and understanding that. So I was kind of like shocked at the number of pastors that said to me, oh, but, you know, we've applied for this COVID thing, we're able to keep all our staff. And I'm thinking, what happened to faith? What ha so I'm not, I'm not putting them down. I'm just saying I don't understand. I don't understand the, the mindset. Um, but I want you to have a look in Acts chapter 19, verse 10. And again, this is like the first couple of weeks is just lots of information because we're laying down a foundation, but then we'll grow and we'll, we'll start moving. Acts chapter 19, verse 10. It says this is where um, Paul went into the synagogue and verse 8, for three months spoke boldly, uh, arguing about the kingdom of God. Verse 10, this continued for two years so that all the inhabitants of the province of Asia, Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. Every inhabitant in that province because every believer was mobilised as part of the ecclesia. It was not about you need to come to church on Sunday and get saved. It was not about, well, let me take you to the pastor so you can get prayed for. The believers did the ministry. The believers did it themselves. And so every place... Every, every inhabitant of the province, Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. And in Romans 15, 19, it challenges me this. It's challenging because it's not the church as we know it today. Uh, Romans 15, 19, even as my preaching has been accompanied with the power of signs and wonders, all of it by the power of the Holy Spirit, the result is that starting from Jerusalem and as far around as Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel, um, faithfully executing, accomplishing, carrying out to the full the good news of Christ. I've fully preached the gospel. And then in verse 20, my ambition has been to preach the gospel, not where Christ's name has already been known, lest I build on another man's foundation, but, I, um, but 
to preach the gospel where it's never been heard before. That's what Paul was saying. So, you know, we've got to understand that as part of the ecclesia, the church is static. The church has a place where we come and we meet and we think I'm going to church instead of realising that you are the church. You are the church. They were amazingly effective as the ecclesia, amazingly effective. And when Jesus ascended to heaven, he released gifts for the ecclesia because those 12 disciples would pretty soon die, although it took a bit for John to go. He was a long time ago and they couldn't get rid of John no matter what they did. But, he, but you know, when the, when the apostles, the 12 disciples that had walked with Jesus had finally gone on to heaven through whatever, you know, like some were persecuted and all sorts of things, we, the body of Christ still needed to be trained up. Jesus took responsibility for building the ecclesia. It was never meant for a gathering to become an institution or for all ministry to happen within a church building. Like I said, there's over 40 miracles in the book of Acts. Only one happened in church. The rest of it was out on the streets, in the marketplaces where people were. And so this is the ecclesia is mobilising ourselves to be everywhere that he's called us to be. The fivefold, these are the gifts of Jesus that he gave to the body of Christ is the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. The apostle is the thumb, and they're able to do all of the other works because the thumb is the only one that touches every other finger. The prophet's the forefinger because it's always in your face saying, thus saith the Lord. <laughs> the evangelist is the longest finger because it's reaching out trying to get people into the kingdom. The pastor is the ring finger because they're the one that loves people, wants to shepherd them, you know, just wants them to... Yeah, it's all about relationship and the teacher's the one that gets in your ear and irritates you at times. But that's the fivefold. Now they've all, and the, the very first session of this, we talked about how they're being restored by the Lord. And this is the time where the apostle, the others have been restored. This is now the apostolic time was being restored, but it doesn't stop with the apostle. It stops or it starts, really starts when the hand works together when the five work together because just one by itself doesn't work and the, the ecclesia was never meant to be run by a pastor That's right. never meant to be run by a pastor it was meant to be run by the fivefold so it's when, we, when the five work together that's when I keep going back to my notes but I realize it's up there and I feel constrained <laughs> So Ephesians 4, 10 to 13, talking about Jesus, and in verse 11, Jesus himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. There are seven reasons why the fivefold is in place. The fivefold should only be about between 2 and 5% of the body of Christ. We are basically householders that store what the body of Christ needs and release it to the people as they need it. Basically, what do you need? Let me give it to you. Off you go and do what God's called you to do. It wasn't about the body of Christ revolving around the fivefold. It was about the fivefold serving the body of Christ and causing them to grow. Yeah. So the first one, for the saints, for the equipping of the saints, it means until we are perfectly adjusted and adapted, qualified for the work of the ministry. So let me tell you something. The minute you are in Jesus Christ, spiritually, you are perfectly adapted. So we might mentally have some things to shift. I might have some baggage from my past. I'm not good enough. I'm not this enough. Whatever. I might have some baggage I've got to get rid of. But the minute I got born again, I came into this divine union with Jesus Christ, with God the Father and, and the Holy Spirit, into this divine union that I can, it's, it, this, this unity with them. You know, that um, I, I died with Christ. I was crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. By the, you know, by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There is this divine unity 
Yeah. That, that is, is how we live. It's not like, and sometimes we're like, oh, I'm not getting, I feel like my prayers are hitting the ceiling. They don't have to hit the ceiling. He's inside you. He's in you. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You, he's made your heart his sanctuary. You don't have to, you know, like, oh, I've got to break through the ceiling. There's nothing to break through. Because you're in Jesus Christ, you automatically live under an open heaven. That's it. There's no hoops to jump through. There's no, no, nothing. Everything was done. Any distance was broken by Jesus. When Jesus was crucified when he, and, and died, do you know what was crucified and died with him? The fall of Adam. Everything that was included in the fall of Adam was buried with Jesus. And it was only resurrection life that came out of that grave with him. So anything that pertains to the fall of Adam, sickness, disease, poverty, confusion, lack of clarity, anything, you know, um, low self-esteem, whatever it is that clouds us, it was, it was part of the fall of Adam. It was buried with Jesus. And it no longer has the legal power to affect us. You are one with Christ. One with Christ. There's no hooks for the enemy in the spirit realm. Now, there might be mentally and there might be from generational iniquities, but all we've got to do is deal with it because Jesus dealt with everything and everything was buried that from the fall was buried. That's why we can redeem time because fallen time was buried. We've got to understand this. So we're equipped the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Just turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. Oh, if I could just get across how amazing you are in God's eyes. 2 Corinthians 3, 5. Not that we're fit or qualified or sufficient in ability of ourselves, but our power, our ability our sufficiency are from God. It is God who has qualified us and made us fit, worthy and sufficient as ministers and dispensers <laughs> of a new covenant. So Jesus himself is your qualifier. He's qualified you. You know, and we tend to think, I don't know enough. I'm not good enough. I haven't had enough experience. Jesus is your qualification. Jesus is your qualifier. Like, what else do you need? Seriously. You're fully qualified in Christ. But our mind gets in the way. Or oh, maybe you need to go to Bible college first. Well, maybe you do. But it doesn't stop you from being 100% qualified because of Jesus. Totally qualified. For, and what were you qualified for? What are you equipped for? For the work of the ministry. That's anything that you do, any undertaking, any enterprise, any business, anything that you do. That's the word work and ministry is service. Wow. Service to God, service to people. Mm -hmm. And what we need to remember is the Hebrew word avadah, which is when we work, it's our worship to God. Work and worship are the same Hebraic root word. Our work is to be our worship. Our worship is our work. And if we went to work worshipping God, it would be a lot different. It wouldn't be a grind. It would be so different. So we're equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, for the work of what they do in service to God and to people. So that can be any undertaking that you do, any kind of business, anything. We tend to think the work of the ministry is a five-fold church service where people can come and be healed, prayed for, delivered, baptised in the Holy Ghost and set free. There is no reason that cannot happen in the streets. Come on. Does not have to happen inside a church building. That's, right. That's why so many church buildings at the moment are being rented out for yoga and all sorts of other things, right? Because it's only used on Sundays and Wednesday nights or whenever it is. Like, come on, get a grip. If we're going to have a training room, it's going to be like the school of Tyrannus, which goes all day, every day. Different people teaching. For the edifying of the body of Christ, it means that we're being built up 
being promoting growth, providing a spiritual structure for the body of Christ. And the fourth thing is till, till. It's always these words, for and till, until we come to the unity of the faith. A oneness, an agreement, as one as Jesus and the Father are one. So you know what? I might not always disagree with something a brother or a sister does. I might not see where they're coming from. I might not understand it. I might think basically, how wrong can you be? <laughs> right? But I am one with them. I'm in Christ with them. So I might not under, under, understand or agree. That's got nothing to do with it. We have come into a unity of the faith. Yes. We have come into agreement around the cross, around what Jesus has done, about the power of his shed blood. That's what we've come into agreement with. It's not up for me to pass a judgment call because I would be passing a judgment on somebody who belongs to Jesus. There's enough judgment in the body of Christ. There's enough accusations. But what this is, is the unity of the faith. We are all in Christ. Christ is in all of us to be one together as God and Jesus are one. That's the, the unity of the faith. You know, just, just pray John chapter 17 for a couple of weeks and, and get the revelation of that. And it's that the just shall live by faith. I used to think that faith was reserved for the big problems of life. You know, for the massive things. You know, I can't pay the bills this week. I haven't got enough food for the kids with kind of thing when I was a single mum. But I used to think, you know, faith is for the big things. And then I realized, oh, my gosh, it's for every breath I take. It's a lifestyle. Every breath I take, everything I do, faith. Offering it up for the glory of God because of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit. The just shall live by faith. And you are just. You cannot be any more just justified than you are. You cannot be less justified. You have you are the just. It's like you've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. You can't be any more righteous, you can't be any less righteous. You just are as righteous in God's sight as Jesus Christ. I find that amazing. Mm -hmm. That God would look at me and think, yeah, you know, she's as righteous as Jesus in my sight. Love that kid. <laughs> for the knowledge of the Son of God, and that word there is epignosis, which means a precise and correct recognition, a discernment and an acknowledgement of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's a little bit different to uh, intimacy. We've got to correctly know him. But I like the word cardionosis because it's heart-to-heart -heart revelation that I would know him heart to heart, that I would recognise him in my heart, that it's heart to heart, not head knowledge, which I can be talked out of, but heart knowledge. But I want to correctly, I don't, you know how those mirrors are sometimes at um, a sideshow and you stand in front of it and all of a sudden you balloon out of shape or you go all, you know, weird looking? Sometimes I think I represent Jesus like that and, and what I represent is one of those weird, perverted kind of reflections, which is not him, but it's because of my understanding of who he is. So I really want to represent and present my Jesus well, Amen. honestly and truthfully. To a perfect man or woman, that means that we would be fully developed. Perfect does not mean you've got to be perfect. It just means grow up. It just means to be... Um, brought to maturity, brought to completion, but it also means complete in mental and moral character. So it's not just spiritual that it's talking about here, it's talking about the soul realm, that we would have um, virtuous soul and, and righteousness. And if you have a look in James chapter 1, verse 2, James, this is the one, I, as a newbie in a Bible college, um, when I was an instructor, Bible college lecturer, I was the new one on staff and every new one on staff got the book of James to preach because you were always tested on what you taught, right? And it, it just, it's just a thing, when you get a revelation, you're tested on it, you know, that life tests you. And James chapter 1 verse 2 where it says, count it all joy. I often wanted to wipe that out of my Bible. 
happy. <laughs> I didn't want to count it all joy. I really didn't want to give thanks for some of the lousy stuff that was going on in my life, but count it all joy. And then it goes on to say, when. When, not if, but when. So it was like inevitable that a when was going to happen and I'm going to be expected to count it all joy. So as the new Bible college lecturer, you get the book of James. I couldn't wait for them to employ the next person. <laughs> I really couldn't. I taught James, I think, for about three years and every time there were so many opportunities to count it all joy. <laughs> so many opportunities. It was just like... Not good, but it says in 2, verse 2, consider it wholly joyful whenever you're enveloped uh, in, or whenever you fall into various trials or various temptations. Be assured and understand that the trial and the proving of your faith brings out endurance, amen, I could agree to that, and steadfastness and patience. But let endurance and steadfastness and patience have a full play and do a thorough work so that you may be a people perfectly and fully developed, lacking in nothing. So counting it all joy is a key to um, being mature, to um, being a perfect man or a woman in the things of God. And again, that perfect is not perfect, it just means mature. And verse 7, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ mature fullness you are filled with the presence the power the agency the grace the riches the kindness the love of an amazing God you, know, you are Galatians 4 19 Paul says that he travailed until Christ would be fully formed in the Galatian people you know Paul travailed for Christ to be fully formed in us you want to know what your destiny is that's it any, any other assignment that you get in business or finances or anything else is secondary if we do not allow Christ to be fully formed in us. Now, spiritually, he is. But in my mind, in the way I see myself, in the way I see him, maybe sometimes not. That's why, you know, renew your mind so you can have a transformed life. Yeah. But Christ needs to be fully formed. So Paul said, I actually travail. I pray in such a way, I intercede for the body of Christ in such a way, it's like a woman giving birth because I need to see Christ fully formed in the body of Christ. Now, if we started praying that for one another, we would see a massive change in situations and circumstances and in our maturity in the things of God. Romans 8.29 says that we are to be conformed to the image of Christ. It's so important that when people look at us, they don't see Suzette, they don't hear Suzette or you, but they have an, they have a, an interaction with Jesus Christ that they can't see where, you know, there's such an overlap of Jesus in us yeah, that we leave eternal deposits in the hearts and the lives of the people around us. Yes. It is so important to love people and to release God Christ, to allow him to be released through us. Yeah. Sometimes I think we have him so bottled up on the inside and hoarding him to ourselves <coughs> that the people around us are starved for a touch of God. Yeah. Romans 8.17 says that we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. So if I am an heir of God, everything God has belongs to me. And if I am a joint heir with Jesus Christ, everything Jesus is, and does and has is, is me also. You have everything Jesus has, everything. Nothing is withheld in God's eyes exactly the same. You have been redeemed back to what Adam and Eve had before the fall. So when you got saved, it was not turning over a new page. It was not starting a new leaf in your book. It was nothing like that. You got totally made a brand new creation, something different that had never before been seen on this planet. Kainos, K-A-I-N-O-S, new, something that had never before been seen here. You were made a brand new creation. And out of that brand new creation, you were redeemed back to what Adam and Eve had before the fall, which is the fullness of God's presence, God's health, God's joy, everything. You walk with God, everything, everything that they had, plus, 
plus you have the extra because we have a covenant with God that can never be broken. Jesus took your place so all the sins that things can, can't come against you. You have got more. Ephesians chapter 1. And we're going to be looking into this next week. But we're moving from a King Saul-based church program into the mentality of the ecclesia, which is governed by the King Jesus Christ. Now, when I talk about the church being a King Saul-based mentality, he was anointed as king by the prophet, so he was a legitimate king. However, he never lived as a king because when he was going to be announced as the king, he was found hiding with the, the, the luggage. Mm -hmm. He was hiding because he had some baggage. And so he might have been anointed as a king, but he did not live as one. He was driven by fear, insecurities and instabilities. And so God is bringing us out of the church-based era, which, praise God, has been salt and light in our communities and all of that, but he's bringing us into an ecclesia, a governmental anointing that carries the fullness of the, of the government of Christ upon the earth, that as, as Adam and Eve walked in it, so do we, but we have the extra because we are in Jesus. Adam and Eve were not in Jesus. And so we are... The sons of God were joint heirs with Jesus Christ and we need to leave our luggage behind and live freely and wholly in Christ. And let me tell you something, the only thing that stops you from fulfilling what God has called you to fulfill is your, is your mentality. So let me tell you why it's so important that we get our act right. Years ago when my kids were little and I'm a single parent, you know, I read that thing in the Bible that you're supposed to leave an inheritance to your children's children. Well, I freaked out because, man, I couldn't even make it day to day. And here I am supposed to be leaving an inheritance for my grandchildren. And I was like, what? And so I was panicking. And I said, God, I don't know how I can leave an inheritance for my children's children when, when what I get from the government on a single mother's pension won't last week to week. And he said, I'm talking about, he said, deal with your spiritual legacy first. And what are you talking about? And he said, the giants that you don't deal with, you leave for your children or your children's children. You must deal with the giants in your own life. You must deal with them. And then we went to Numbers chapter 14, 33, where it says that the younger generation, you know, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years because the parents would not take on the giants that confronted them. And they said, no, we can't do that. And so the judgment of God came. Well, you're going to have to wander for 40 years in the wilderness. Well, that 40 years in the wilderness defined the next generation to be shepherds instead of overcomers and takers of the promised land. Numbers 14.33, the younger generation wandered 40 years in the wilderness as shepherds when they were meant to be overcomers, when they were meant to take the promised land. Come on, what we do and how we live our lives affects the next generation. And if you don't have children, there are spiritual children. It's what we are leaving for the next generation. Come on, you don't want them wandering as shepherds in the wilderness when they can be a part of the ecclesia and releasing heaven upon earth. We've got to really change the way we see things. We've got to strip ourselves of all kinds of churchianity and we've got to take hold of the ecclesia. And it's kind of like a walk with like Abraham. You know, God says, well, just follow me and I'll show you the land I'm going to give you. Well, and we're saying, well, God, we want to be part of the ecclesia and we have an understanding to a certain point, but we're not 100% sure what this looks like, what this means, how this really functions. And so we need you to show us. And he's saying, well, you're either going to walk with me now mm -hmm. or you're going to stay in the church well, well, so this is an awakening time as you said the page is turning mm -hmm. yeah. this is the third day church yeah. Yeah. and the third day church cannot live like a second day church which was going to end up in the grave it was on the third day that Jesus rose. We've got to rise up in resurrection power. The church, the body of Christ, the ecclesia of God, they are the ones who carry the solutions of God for all the problems that face the nations on the world. We can change the economy of a nation. We can change the families of a nation. If we listen to God and we step out as part of the ecclesia with the, the divine solutions that he gives us, we can break through and we can bring transformation to nations, towns, communities, families and cities and we will we will actually start to form a sheep nation instead of Australia heading down the path of a goat nation. Yes. So this, we've got to really understand we're not supposed to be shepherds. 
We're supposed to be overcomers, more than conquerors, taking the ground, being part of the ecclesia. I'm grateful for the local church. It's brought me to where I am, but I can't stay in a local church. And I repent because I have tried so hard to be a pastor. I am not pastoral. I'm apostolic. Like, let's just get on with the job. That's why I need the fivefold around me. So the prophet can say, hey, wait a minute, you've got to stay in the timing of God. This is what I see coming. So the evangelist will say, hey, wait a minute, we haven't got the right number of people. We need to get some more people saved. So the pastor can say, hey, wait a minute, we need to change the way the people think and talk and pray. And then the teacher says, hey, we're going to be the ecclesia. We need to change the way we've been teaching some stuff. We need everybody to be a part of this, but we can't stay as a church. And so I repent because I've tried to straddle and tried to like kind of work out what God's doing and how to keep the church kind of thing happening until we came. Look, let's just forget it and just step across. And, and you know, we might make some mistakes and it's okay to make mistakes because Jesus is the ultimate redeemer. It is okay if it comes from an honest heart and we're just, oh, God, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. It's not a problem. He can fix it. But we can't straddle the fence anymore. And we can no longer allow the, the, the church mindset of just going to a church building and in being part of a service and then going home to continue because nothing changes. You, you know, like 10 years ago, we still had financial problems, health problems, marital problems. We still had stuff happening. As the ecclesia, you make the change. <coughs> And I know I love you. That's, that's, I mean, I love you, but I'm not pastoral. And I'm so happy to shake that off <laughs> and just be who God's called me to be because you need to be who God's called you to be. You need to find your, your flow in the ecclesia and we need to come together. We're going to start, you know, another couple of weeks of, of just teaching and explaining different things and we're going to start breaking up into groups and we're going to take on different things. We're going to see a, a people in, in the ecclesia of open heaven that live in a disease-free, prosperity-rich, wisdom, creative, innovative wisdom ecclesia that actually can bring change to the people around us. But we've got to do it in our own lives first. And it's when we start dealing with ourselves and our own lives that we start to recognise the, I don't know what you want to call them, the protocols of the kingdom that we then need for the community or the city or the nation. So we're not supposed to be shepherds, which is what when we come to church, we come, we sit, we're very docile, we're obedient. Although I must say, thank you, not everybody here is a yes person and I'm grateful. But, you know, but it's not about coming and sitting. It is about fulfilling the destiny God's placed upon you. God's written a book about you. He wants you to fulfill everything in that book. Okay, this is, you know, we've got to mobilise really mobilise. You've got, to, you've got to really understand how important you are to the kingdom of God. Yeah. So good. <sighs> so good. Ephesians, we'll just finish with these two scriptures. Ephesians 1, 4. It's not easy being confined by PowerPoint either. <laughs> Ephesians 1.4, even as God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, before the foundation of the world, you were chosen by God in Christ. Before the world even began, you were chosen by God, that we should be holy and blameless in His sight, even above reproach before Him in love. You, you have been redeemed back to that. And Ephesians 2.6 that God has raised us up together with Christ and made us sit down together in Christ Jesus, the Messiah. The Mirror Study translation says that we have been given a co-executive authority because we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. You have the same authority as Jesus Christ because you've been given the power of attorney to use his name. You have a co-executive authority. What Jesus, you, what Jesus can do, you can do. You just need to be submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. But you've been given the full use of his name, his power and his authority. So you are part of the ecclesia. And I know that I'm speaking to the converted, but I just want to lay some groundwork because some, some people here have never heard this before, some have. But when we come together, 
This is what you've been called to do. You are a part of God's solution for the world. So whatever makes you angry could well be part of your destiny. If you get angry about something, it could well be a sign that God has put that in your destiny to fix. Because some of the things that we can't stand, the thing, the injustices in certain areas, God has got his hand and he says, I know that ticks that person off, so they'll be great for doing transformation. <laughs> so this is the thing, and we've had the, prof the prophetic word through Leah and Elizabeth today, that this is the page is turning, that the undermining is gone, Come on. and it's a new thing, there's an awakening. We can no longer be part of the institutionalized church. We are part of an organism, a living, breathing body of Christ. And Jesus said, and, and that was King James himself that changed the wording from ecclesia to church because he was a king. And if the people understood that they were part of a governmental authority, he might not stay on the throne for very long. And so he changed the word to a gathering, or assembly, or church because he wanted to be secure on his throne. There's a number of words that King James kept uh, or, or slightly mistranslated to keep his throne. So it's a recognition. You are as Jesus is. <laughs> you are as Jesus is. You've, we've got to get rid of the things that keep us at this level and allow the Holy Spirit and Christ to bring us up to that level where you are truly ascended with Christ in God. <clears throat>